there's anything we're going to stand on, let's stand together in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could gather into your house. This is your house, God. And we enter in with thanksgiving and praise. We want to enter your courts with shouts of joy for who you are. So, Heavenly Father, we just pray and we just want to submit ourselves now to your word, God, that you would teach us this morning. I'm just going to get out of the way, Lord. Take a sinner like me and push me aside, Heavenly Father, that we could hear your breath, your word. May you instruct us this morning, God. And so, Heavenly Father, this time is dedicated to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We praise you, God, for who you are, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one that was at the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of heaven and earth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated, and the students can go to Sunday school. Praise God. We are in continuing in Romans, in the 10th chapter of Romans. If you want to open up your Bibles, we're going to be looking at verses 5 uh, through 13 this morning. And I titled this message, A Righteousness Beyond Religion. And on Monday nights here, we have a class called Foundations, and it, it's about theology. And it made me think uh, over this week of the first class that when we were attending, and it was about theology, and everybody goes, oh boy, here we go. Um, it's not to make you a professor in any way, but it's about the study of God. And, and in that study, in the video that we had watched, um, it is, R.C. Sproul had the opportunity to go to a college and uh, give a talk, a lecture at a college, and it was about um, what does it mean to be a Christian college? What does it mean to be a Christian college? And, and at the heart of it all, he said, it is theology, which is the study of God, the person of God. It's the person of God who we come here this morning collectively together to worship, the person of God. And he said, it's the heart of it all. And they gave him a tour of the school, and as he was doing this, he happened to notice that the Department of Theology, the name had been changed to the Department of Religion. And if you notice, a lot of universities today, including Christian University, have changed the name from the Department of Theology to the Department of Religion. And you're probably saying to yourself, so what? Well, there is a big difference. See, theology has two parts to it. Theos, meaning God, and logos, meaning word or reason. So it is really concerning themselves about the application of the logic of God, but it is about God himself. The study of religion deals with something totally different. It's, it's simple, yet it's studying really humanity's response to theology, religion. And so really what they've done in colleges is they've taken the study off of God and put it on human beings. So he asked a group when they got together, he goes, when did this happen? Well, no one was around at that time. And he also asked, why do you think a Christian college would change from the Department of Theology to the Department of Religion? And believe it or not, no one really had an answer. But I think it's important. Because as we read in Romans chapter 10, this is, this is an issue. See, in fact, most of you, when you read the Bible, even when I read the Bible, we could have things called presuppositions. So we look at the Bible and we read the Bible through a lens. And the lens is usually either theology or religion. We're, we're thinking about, oh, well, you know, you're telling people about the message that you heard the past Sunday, and they're going, oh, that, well, that's what your church teaches. These ta they're talking about religion here. Right? Or really, are we speaking about God, what God's word says to God's people? Are we preaching God's word that you could know this God, the greatness of this God, that call to worship that Matt gave this morning? How beautiful is it? He's righteous, he's just, 
Is this the God that consumes your mind? Or you got a picture of God through a religion that you've followed your whole life? It's just a big issue. And it's an issue that the Apostle Paul had to deal with in the early church. And as he was writing this epistle. So that's where we're going to go today. And uh, we're going to be looking at this text in Romans chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at it through the lens of theology and not religion. So if you would stand with me, we're going to look at Romans 10, 5 through 13 as I read to you this morning. And we'll just pray as God teaches us this morning. Beginning in verse 5 and ending in verse 13. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. That the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. This is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the, with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all. Of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Heavenly Father, help us in understanding this morning. You may be seated. So last week we, we looked at the first four verses. And part of this lens of theology is something about an attribute about God himself. There is a theme here. And one of the things that I, I put on the, uh, the Facebook page at one time, and I don't know if it's even there, but the question came about, I put 15 things that you can ask questions of the Bible to help you study the Bible. And one of the things that I know was on there was the use of emphatic words. When Jesus wants to say something, and he really wants you to listen, he repeats it over and over again. When he wanted to get, you know, when he wanted to get Nicodemus to listen to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, right? And, and so we've got this picture in Scripture here. And if you were to look at this, part of this lens of theology is an attribute of God. And the lens that we want to look through is his righteousness. Look at this from verse 3 from last week. It says, for being ignorant of what? The righteousness of God. First time. And seeking to establish their own, they did not to submit to God's righteousness. Second time. For in Christ is the end of the law for righteousness a third time, everyone who believes. And then it goes into verse 5. For Moses wrote about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them, but the righteousness based on faith. Do you see something here? He wants you to know something about God as he enters in once again to this discussion. He's contrasting the righteousness from the law and a righteousness based by faith. And he's going to bring this out, but the righteousness of God is what's ultimately important. The rightness of him. The rightness of God himself. What deems right to the people is from him. And he keeps repeating this. So we got to understand it. You should underline these. When you start seeing emphatic use of words, underline it, highlight it. What does he mean? Why is he focusing on God's righteousness? See, because if we want to talk about just religion, everybody's got this right way to God. He wants to dispel all those things. Let's just talk about theology. Let's just talk about God himself and his righteousness. To understand, he is the bottom righteousness. He's not, oh, well, he takes everything we just give him. When we call him great, he just takes it and he's so happy. No, he's the bar of righteousness. Of all the rightness in the world, he is the measure. He's the full measure. And this is what the Apostle Paul is trying to communicate once again. Remember, he has a burden for these people. These were his kinsmen. How could they not know him? They, they said, remember it says they were zealous for him, but without knowledge. 
You know what they were doing? They were practicing religion. How much of your lives have you spent just practicing religion? It can be depressing, right? Because we may never even really know God. In fact, we might be sincere in our religion, but never know the one true God, to know the righteousness of God. And he's unveiling this now to his people. It's a divine reality. He really wants to expose the reality of God himself. So I've got a couple of points, and we'll walk through the scriptures this morning. The first point is this. A righteousness beyond religion is a righteousness based on faith. And we look at a few verses here. I'd also say, I don't know if there's any left. There is none. I had notes there. My notes, I, I, I type out, and I put there for anyone who wants to take them. But we're in Romans 10, 5. It says, for Moses writes about a righteousness that is based on the law, that a person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith, as we said, doesn't say in your heart who will ascend or who will descend in verse 7. So what is the Apostle Paul saying? Again, he's beginning this contrast of righteousness. God gave the law. And it says in verse 4, he talks about how Christ is the end of the law for one reason, for righteousness. He's not saying that the moral law, the Decalogue, is abolished. He's not saying that at all. He's saying that you shall not murder still. You shouldn't covet. You shouldn't do any of these things. But what he's saying, to be right with God, the end is the law will bring you to someone who can accomplish all of it. And his name is Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's why it's the end. He is the result of a law. A law exposes our own iniquity to fulfill the law. We can't do it. It brings you to a place to say, I need you, Lord. I need you because I can't do it myself. But what it does complete is the ceremonial law. Remember, there's more than just the Decalogue, the moral law. There was a ceremonial law. And that was a law God gave for the sacrificial system for Israel, right? So he is the Lamb of God. There's no more need for sacrifice. Christ fully fulfilled the sacrificial system for Israel. He is the Lamb of God. He was sacrificed once and for all. And so it was abolished. He completed it. Not abolished, but he completed it. The Apostle Paul is making this contrast. Because at the end of the day, here is the reality. Someone who follows the law, or if you want to follow your religion, you are going to follow it all the way to the day of standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and God himself. And you will stand on your own efforts in that religion. But if you're searching for God, through his son, Jesus Christ, and through his life and death, the sacrificial lamb for you, you will stand. One will stand on his own efforts, and it's going to be a bad day. Another will stand in the mercy of God because of his only begotten son, and there will be glory. This is important. You know, Moses here is quoting the... Uh, the apostle quotes Leviticus 18, 1 through 5. He says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt and where you lived, and you shall not do as they did in the land of Canaan. They were around paganism all the time. Egypt, very pagan. And the land, the Canaanites, very pagan. He's saying, Listen, when I take you, when you've been taken out, you're not going to live like you did in Egypt. You're not going to live like this anymore. In fact, you're not even going to live like the Canaanites lived. You're my people. You're going to live like I called you to live. And, and he's exposing something here for them. That he would reconcile them. He says that you shall keep my statutes and my rules. And if a person does them... He shall live by them. I am the Lord. You can see how Paul was using this. But you know, in context, you know what they were talking about was the practices that were happening in Egypt and in Canaan. And it had to do with relationships. Had to do with sex. Had to do with family. Had to do with all of these things. And they were unrestrained in their actions. 
So he says, listen, you're not going to live like that. You know, here's one of the biggest cautions for the church today. We could be so influenced by the world that we're going to live just like them. These words that Moses wrote should echo to us. We need to be different. When, when Christ came into your life and he took you out of the darkness and brought you to his marvelous light, he's saying, guess what? You're not going to live like you were in Egypt anymore. And you're not going to live like where I'm going to take you. Glory in heaven. You're going to live here now under my authority, under my word. You need to live this Christian life. And he's bringing this whole thing to light from the Old Testament. Remember from last week, it says they were ignorant. They didn't understand the righteousness of God. They understood their religion. They understood if they brought the sacrifice. They understood if they went to the three times of prayer. If they understood if they did what the religious folks told them to do, that they would be fine. But God was pulling the veil on them and using the Apostle Paul to say, wait a minute, understand this. You can no longer be ignorant of these things. Deuteronomy 27, 26. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. You know, this curse was given to everyone from Adam. And what's required from keeping this law is absolute perfection in every detail of the law. Can you see how hopeless this could all be for everyone, for all of us? In fact, James wrote this, James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of it all. That if we keep this religious attitude, and even though we know that we're not fulfilling it, we're not doing it all right, what's going to happen? It says it's going to be a bad day. We become guilty of all of it. Paul's almost like preaching a three-point sermon here. And here's his three points. The man who tries to pursue salvation by trying to keep the law will be judged on the basis of that effort. Point one. Point two. It's impossible to keep the whole law. Point two. Point three, the inevitable failure of works righteousness, religion, results in eternal damnation. In other words, turn to Jesus Christ. There's no greater need for the gospel than knowing we can't do it. We need a savior. We need Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven to come to this earth for this very reason, to call his sheep. And he talks about this righteousness by faith, based on faith. And throughout the Bible, the obedience is not just the externalities, but of the heart. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, Hear, o, is, hear o Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is on the inner of the person. And imagine, do you do this? Do you love God every day with all your heart, mind, soul, strength? Do you live this way that you, the world sees this? This is why we need Jesus Christ. Chapter 7, Moses writes, The Lord did not set his love on you, uh, on you, nor chose you because you, your number was greater. He says you were fewer. He set his love on you because he wanted you. He set his love on you because it wasn't the great things that you'd done in your life. He set his love on you unconditionally, fully, because he wanted you. It's a whole different perspective. See, this is not religion. Religion says, do this, do this, do this, do this. I don't know, that's where I came from. I don't know about you. And then, and then you realize, boy, there's a lot of work. This is like the treadmill of life. Charles Spurgeon said this, if you think you can get there on your own, it's like climbing to heaven on a rope of sand. We shouldn't deceive ourselves. We need Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of framework in my notes. I put a lot of references in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy gives you a whole litany of this. 
In all of scripture is God's sovereign grace, salvation always begun with God's grace, which is made effective for the sinner when he comes to God in faith. Man could not earn salvation by searching for Christ. So you, it, it's not like you've got to do these works like you've got to climb the stairway to heaven. That's what Led Zeppelin thought. <laughs> right? You, 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 these works like you, you're going to climb so high to bring Christ down. Or if you feel like you've got to go to the lows of low that for some reason you've got to do something to the depths to, to bring Christ up. No, you need to accept what Christ has done. He's done it all. We, we've had no part in it. Christ did it all. He descended and he ascended. But he descended to us to call his own, to be crucified, to be the Lamb of God, to fulfill, to be the end of this law that held so many in prison. It was him and it was him alone. This is the righteousness by faith. And it has its, it has its assurance in the work in the imputed righteousness of Christ. A righteousness from the law through works denies Christ's incarnation. Do you not, did you realize that? If, if righteousness was through your works, then Christ did not need to come. A righteousness of, from the law through works denies his resurrection because you wouldn't need his redemption. A righteousness from the law through works denies his gracious salvation through Christ provided in his blood. I love what Jeffrey Wilson wrote, a quote from him. The sheer perversity of unbelief is shown by many who prefer to undertake an impossible odyssey rather than to put their trust in an accessible Christ. You know, this is why he gave the Holy Spirit to the church. This is why he indwells you that this message of the gospel continues to go. Do you know there's people walking around right now that God, that God himself wants and he wants the gospel to be preached to them and he is going to do a work through that. He's going to turn the light switch on. And you know something? He wants to use you. Isn't this amazing? I love the time that we're living in. I know everybody says, this, oh, it's hell going to hell in a handbasket, right? I believe this is the time for the church. And when we believe in the gospel, when we believe in the work of Jesus Christ, we know that he's still doing it today. And he wants to use us to preach this gospel. That yes, we were sinners, we were far from God, but what? He sent his only begotten son into this earth, into the reality of time. And he brought him to walk and to be. The word literally became flesh and he dwelt among us. And he took the sin, the sin of man, and placed it upon the cross. God placed all his wrath. The lights went out. The lights literally went out. And he shook the earth. This is how much wrath was being put on his only begotten son, his beloved son. And he said he was pleased to do so. So that man could be redeemed. You could be redeemed. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This world needs Jesus Christ. They just don't know it. See, because they believe in their heart of hearts and sincerely, I'm a good enough person. I've got enough goodness in me. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this, no one is righteous. No, not one. That means me. That means you. That means the people that you're going to meet at the grocery store, your cashier, your librarian, your teacher, everyone, no one. You can underline that. We all have the same great need, amen? And there's a righteousness beyond religion given through the word. Romans 10, 8, what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we proclaim. To amplify the righteousness by faith, Paul speaks of the hope of the gospel which he preaches. In other words, man does not need to climb that stairway to heaven or search in those depths. God's word has been revealed. His way of salvation has been made known. 
And if you come on Sunday night, you would have already heard this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace, God's grace is he's given you something you did not deserve. For by grace, God himself, you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. Even under the old covenant, men who could claim God's grace simply receiving it by faith. That's exactly what Abraham did. John MacArthur has a quote. He says, much of Western society today is like Israel of Paul's day. Although most unbelievers have a limited and often distorted concept of Christianity, they have a general idea of its claims and have access. Everyone has access to Bibles, to churches, and even to other Christians, through which they could easily discover the gospel if they honestly desired to do so. But tragically, however, men still choose works righteousness. I'm just going to work real hard. I'm going to be a good guy. I want to be a good dad. I'm just going to try to be a good guy. And I just hope at the end, there's enough goodness in me. That's a delusion to what the Bible teaches. He says, no one's righteous. No, not one. You need the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what the word teaches. From verse 8, Paul's quoting Deuteronomy 30, verse 14, which speaks of a confession by the mouth and the heart to believe. And Paul repeats within these two verses, 9 and 10, what's interesting from the mouth and the heart. And in, he, and in verse 10, he puts it in chronological order and redemption. Mouth and heart. That which we confessed is the outpouring of of what's in our heart. From the, for, for, the, for the heart one believes and is justified. And this is, we're not talking about easy believism. Israel had been given the oracles of God and did not believe. It says they were actually ignorant. They didn't understand. They totally understood their religion. It was passed down. They, they did the festivals. They did the traditions. They did the sacrifice. They tied their herbs. They did everything that their religion told them to do, and yet they did not know God. Could that happen to us? Could that happen that we could just go through the motions each day? Isn't it easy to say that, hey, Christian, watch your football game. Well, maybe you shouldn't be watching football on Sunday, but watch your football. You, you can't watch a game without someone getting in the end zone and going like this. It's so easy just to say, isn't it? And I'm not doubting, maybe, praise the Lord. There's a lot of athletes that are coming out now speaking of Jesus Christ, and I thank God for that. But it's easy just to say, this is not easy believism, what I'm talking about here. And it wasn't easy for them. This is the transformative work of the Holy Spirit, the regenerating of the heart. Um, the Apostle Paul calls it the circumcision of the heart that gives saving faith in which we are made right with God. And from that heart, one speaks, confesses that Jesus is Lord. And this word in the Greek is kurios. Just so you know, someone can say, I believe Jesus is Lord. And that might be easy to say, but what, the, what it said in the original language means you're saying, Jesus Christ is my master. What does that mean? You report to him. You do what your master tells you to do. Is that you? Is that the Lord that you follow? It means ruler. Does his word take authority over your life? Or is it something that, oh yeah, we talk about on Sunday morning in church and then I just take it, I take my Bible and I put it in the file cabinet and I'm going to pull it out on Sunday morning before I come to church. No, Christ wants to, he has authority, he says, over heaven and earth. He sits enthroned in heaven and has all authority. Do you submit to his authority? That's what the Bible is, what he's teaching here from the scripture. It says, curios means owner. Owner. By the purchase, he purchased you with his own blood. He owned you. Which means, you need not worry if you believe in him. Because he owns you. He's going to take you into glory. Owner. It also means sovereign one. 
the one who's in control over everything. This is what he says if, when you confess that Jesus is Lord. That's the most important part of your confession. Jesus is Lord. Not the Patriots or the Red Sox or the Celtics. Not the government of the United States. Whew. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is in control. And he's called the church, he's raised the church generation to generation that a gospel will be preached, that this world would know who is the Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our master, our ruler. He owns us. He's sending us. That's what it means to be the church, the ecclesia, that we have this message of hope for a world that is absolutely hopelessness. People don't even know who they are anymore. How can this be? We've been created in the image of God, and guess what? We're involved in the gospel of Jesus Christ that we'd be restored back to the image of God. You might go day. This is what he's talking about in this text. And the evidence of the saving faith from our confession of faith is public baptism, openly and unashamedly. This is what the Lord says, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Mark 8, 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is what he's talking about when he comes back. You know, we're not to be ashamed. The Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. We shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. We should confess what's in our heart. If he's not Lord, you're not going to be able to confess it. But truly, if he, is, if he has transformed your heart, he's given you a love and affection for him that you never had before. And for God himself. And from that comes the confession of faith. Verse 11 says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. See, this is not an incidental thing. It's a fundamental thing. Let me repeat that. This is an, not an incidental thing. It's not this thing that just happens and comes and goes like waves of the ocean. It is fundamental to our faith to say this. Jesus is Lord. Who runs this church? Jesus is Lord. Who saved you? Jesus is Lord. Who is going to come again to raise Jesus is Lord. That's our profession. That's our confession. And all those who confess this will be saved. Jesus Christ came to seek and save the lost. He did not come for the self-righteous religious. He came for the sick and the destitute. He came for the lost and the lonely. He came for the burden and the heavy laden. He descended and ascended, and he sits at the right hand of God right now in heaven. In glory. And he will come again. Our king. Our king is coming. And the banner of all Christianity. Stands or falls on this one testimony. Jesus is Lord. Not on our constitution and bylaws. Jesus is Lord. The power of the church today. Is Jesus is Lord. And then a righteousness beyond religion. Ends with this, it demonstrates the universal nature of sin and salvation. Romans 10, 12 through 13. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord over it all, bestowing riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no distinction. There's no distinction in the sin nature of man or woman from the fall of Adam. It's not determined by any ethnicity or a tribe that was out in the bush that never heard of the gospel. No, this sin nature of man 
has nothing and it has no distinctions in ethnicity or race or no external relating issues historically or culturally that sin has divided man from God in the original sin resulting from the fall of Adam which that was given to all. There's no difference. There's no distinction. Guess what? Everyone you meet are in the same mud puddle. There's no distinction. In the same way of salvation, there's no distinction. There's not a distinction of race or ethnicity. Paul wrote this to the church at Galatia. In Galatians 3.28, he says, There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For all are one in Christ. It's through Christ alone that we are saved, through grace alone and by faith alone. There's no distinction. It's not because you're precious because you're an Israelite, a Jew. No, it's for the Jew and the Gentile. The gospel are for those that God calls through Jesus Christ. They are the ones. They are the ones that will abide in the vine, the true vine. They are the ones that partake in the true bread, Jesus Christ. They are the ones that will enter the true tent through Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 22, 26. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. This was the work of the law. So that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law. Imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. He was the end of it. In order that we might be justified by faith. But now faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. Everyone's going to come the same way. Through faith. God calls. He's calling through the gospel He's calling through the words of Christ. And as people hear this, there are some that this message, this call is just taken. And God does something with that. And they believe. It's faith and believing. And this belief, there is no distinction. You could, you could grow up in the White House. It doesn't matter where you grew up. You could grow up in the worst neighborhood, in the poorest house, or the richest house. You could grow up with a great job. It doesn't matter. It's through faith. The righteousness of God is revealed for faith, from faith. There is no distinction. Jesus is Lord over all. Those that come to faith and believe will receive the blessings of the new covenant in Christ. And he is the Lord over all, who stands on their works, who stands and just hoping for the best, standing on that rope of sand, will face damnation. That's what the scriptures say. I think we should pause here for a moment. I think, you know, we talked about this yesterday in, um, in Behold Your God about a lot of people read the Bible, but not many people meditate on the Bible. And meditations have been kind of like taken and people think yoga and, you know, stand and go like this and kind of fold your legs in a funny way and all this. But that's not meditation. Meditation is this. It's not about emptying yourself. It's about filling yourself. That's when the scriptures talk about meditation. When you think, you process it, the word of God shouldn't go through one ear and then out the other. There's a process that he wants to instruct and teach you. We should be thinking about just what we read this morning about the righteousness of God. That there is a rightness of God that only God himself is going to hold. There's no other works. There's no other way but through Christ. So I just want to ask this question. Have you been depending on your own works? Are you good enough? Have you been zealous in your own works to outshine, outdo everybody else? Is that what you've been depending on? Have you been resisting Christ because you don't want to let go? You've been through a tough time in your life and, and you, you, you want to be in control. 
How many people got issues with control here? <laughs> Praise the Lord, because I know everybody does to a certain extent, right? Maybe even your own determination for heaven. And you don't want to let go. How many of you are resisting Christ right now? The Apostle Paul is speaking to every one of us this morning. He's saying there's no distinction. Listen, you got to let go. You can't follow your own way. But if you've been depending on your own works, on your own works, you shall stand before the Lord. And he's going to say to you, didn't you read in Romans chapter 3? Didn't you read in Romans chapter 6? That no one's righteous? No, not one. And the, the wages of sin is death. Didn't you read this? Did you, did you ever think about this? Did you ever let it process into your heart? How many times has he used the word righteousness? He's trying to get his attention on the rightness of God before he talks about anything else. Have you really processed that? Thinking about God, the righteousness of God. And then start reading some other passages. I'll tell you, go to the Psalms. The Psalms, it just brings out and magnifies God. The righteousness, the majesty, the holiness of God. You want a bigger picture of God. Have you processed this? Or are you depending on your own works? Have you depended on a religious process to be the means of salvation? Oh, you know, I know I was brought up Roman Catholic. I've said it before. It was good enough for my great-grandfather and my grandfather and my mother and father and everybody after that. It should be good enough for me. But is that really true? Have you been depending on a religious process instead of the theology, who God really is? Have, have, you, have you viewed everything like, okay, I know Jesus Christ died on the cross and that's enough, okay. Have you, have you done your sacraments and hoping that that sacraments is part of that stairway to heaven for a means of salvation, for a rightness with God? Have you depended on those things? I bet you a lot of us have, at least in the past. I know I have. And I've had to repent from those things and turn to Jesus Christ, who's done it all. Have you turned to Jesus Christ? Have you received the righteousness beyond religion? Can you stand on that day without Christ? These are powerful questions. I love one of my favorite Psalms in the Bible, is Psalm 1. And it talks about the, the, the blessed man who, you know, he doesn't sit, stand, or whatever with the wicked. But he said this. He said that they, they, they love the word of God. You know, he, he reads the word of God. And let me not kill it. Let me just read it to you really quick. Psalm 1 is one of the shortest psalms in the Bible. It's a, it's a great psalm. And I think it's one worth meditating on. Because I want to give you, it gives you a couple of pictures here. Here's the picture. It said, blessed are the man, and then he goes into negative, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor sit, stands in the way of sinners. He doesn't walk, he doesn't stand, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He lives his life blessed with God. He doesn't hang out, act like the world. He doesn't walk like it. He don't sit with them and, and converse like them. He doesn't sit, weigh, stand. He doesn't do any of that. But his delight, it says, is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Do you know that the word of God says he'll never leave you or forsake you? He'll never leave you. Do you hold on? We, saw, we sang a song about the promises of God this morning. You hold on to these promises that he said that there needed to be a redeemer come. Because at the end of the law, we were sunk. Everybody sunk. We couldn't accomplish it. And that's why he sent his only begun son to be the end of the law for us. To fulfill this law for us. Do you understand these great promises of scripture? Have you thought about your own waywardness? And that yet, even though why you were sinners, Christ died for you, the scripture says. He didn't look at you and just say, you know what? Let him go. No. He sent the hounds of heaven for you. You ever think about this? 
See, this is where saving faith comes in. This is where belief comes in. The reality of God himself comes to the individual. I pray today that the word of God, the word is seed, hit good soil this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word is the lamp of, to our feet and the light to our path. And more importantly, Heavenly Father, it's every promise like we sang today is yes and amen. Heavenly Father, from the beginning of Scripture, from Genesis, Lord, there was a great need of a Savior. The contradiction to your word from a serpent and a glorious gospel proclamation that the seed of the woman would come. Lord Jesus, we just say thank you for coming, for dwelling, for carrying, for being pierced for our transgressions. We thank you for being a sinless Savior who could do what we could not do. In everything, he fulfilled the law without sin. And he, and he took on the sin of the world. Our sin imputed to him and imputed to us his righteousness that we could stand before God. He was the only perfect fulfiller of the law. It took perfection, and perfection came in Jesus Christ. So we pray right now. I pray here for someone, whoever, that might have been depending on religion their whole life, God. I pray that today, Heavenly Father, they'd walk away and turn to you, cry out to you, that they would believe in their heart and they would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. I pray today for those that think they're good enough and the idea of they're good enough is based on their own standards. But Lord, I pray that they would see the righteousness of who you are, the bar which you have set. Heavenly Father, and I pray that they would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. So God, we ask for the work of the Holy Spirit, Lord. We know that we cannot do this. Only you can do this. God, we pray and we ask in your name that if some here today have calling upon your name, that they would be saved. So, Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you've done far more abundantly than what we could ever think of or even ask for. So we say thank you. We say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.